Okay, the next item on the agenda today is an information item to provide us with the 2016-2017 regulatory oversight report for research reactors and class 1B accelerators as outlined in CMDs 18-M32 and 18-M32.A. The public was invited to comment in writing. No interventions were filed by the public. Representatives from the licensees are joining us by teleconference or are here in person. They will be provided with an opportunity to comment after CNSC staff's presentation and will be available for questions. I'll go through the list of participants to see who's on the teleconference line. From the Royal Military College, uh, Dr. Samuel Eve and Dr. Lewis, can you hear us? Yes, you yes. can. Thank you. Uh, from the University of Alberta, Dr. Duke and Dr. Moore? Yes, we're present. Thank you. From the Saskatchewan Research Council, Mr. Chorney. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, de l'Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal, Professor Marlowe, est-ce que vous êtes avec nous? Um, je crois que Dr. Chilien est également en ligne. Dr. Chilien? Yeah, I'm here. You're very well. I'm here. Ah, thank you. Uh, from Triumph, Dr. Bagger. Dr. Bagger, are you with us? Okay, uh, if we can see if, if Trump's going to join us. Uh, from Canadian Light Source Inc., Dr. Cutler, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. And uh, we've got Mr. Heisel and Mr. Zick from the McMaster University in attendance. Um, thank you. I'll now turn the floor over to uh, the CNSC staff for their presentation. Mr. Tadros, the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning, uh, President Velshi, members of the Commission. For the record, I am Heidi Tadros, the Director General of the Directorate of Nuclear Cycle and Facilities Regulation. With me today to present this uh, ROR is my colleague, are my colleagues, Dr. Caroline Ducrot. She is the Director of the Nuclear Facilities um, Division, and to her left, Mr. Mark Berders. Director of the Accelerators in the Class II Facilities Division, who will present the second part of this presentation. The next few slides provide a brief introduction and background information for this regulatory oversight report. Just want to make sure you have the slides as well. Perfect. Thank you. This slide outlines the uh, regulatory oversight report format, as well as the format for staff's presentation this morning. The first part of this ROR describes the regulatory performance of research reactors comprising the McMaster nuclear reactor and the four Slowpoke II reactors located at the Royal Military College of Canada, at University of Alberta, at Saskatchewan Research Council, and at École Polytechnique de Montréal. The second part of this presentation discusses the regulatory performance of the Class 1B accelerators in Canada, comprising Triumph and Canadian Light Source. CNSC staff presented a regulatory oversight report for the first time for these facilities in 2016, which covered the performance over the 2015 calendar year. There was no ROR prepared for these facilities in 2017, and therefore, this report covers calendar years 2016 and 2017. This ROR includes highlights of regulatory compliance effort by CNSC staff, followed by performance summary covering all 14 safety and control areas, or SCAs. The radiation protection, environmental protection, and conventional health and safety, SCAs, will be discussed in greater detail as they provide key performance indicators as to the functioning of all programs required for safety. We will also discuss other matters of regulatory interest, such as public information programs, financial guarantees, and any updates to the CNSC regulatory framework relevant to these nuclear facilities. This report is also an opportunity to inform the Commission and the public of key developments with these facilities, including anticipated work and projects for the future. On April 3rd, 2018, a notice of participation at commission meeting and particip participant funding was issued and posted on the CNSC website. 
This ROR was available for public consultation for 30 days from June 22nd to July 23rd, 2018. No interventions on this ROR were received. Regulatory oversight reports are one of the pillars used by the CNSC to report to the Commission and members of the public on licen licensees' regulatory pro performance. RORs are presented in public proceedings and it is an opportunity for the public to participate. This presentation and the ROR are available to the public through the CNSC website. The CNSC regulates the nuclear sector in Canada, including the research reactors and the Class 1B accelerators, ensuring the protection of the health, safety and security of Canadians and the environment, ensuring the implementation of Canada's international commitments on the peaceful use of nuclear energy, and disseminating objective, scientific, technical and regulatory information to the public. CNSC's regulatory oversight of licensed facilities and activities reduces the risk to people and the environment. The CNSC achieves this mandate through the authority under the Nuclear Safety and Control Act, the regulations, the licenses issued by the Commission, and the CNSC's regulatory documents. CNSC staff use a risk-informed approach in determining the amount of compliance verification activities at each facility meaning that the effort in, is commensurate with the risk associated with the facility. For example, the risk associated with a slowpoke reactor operating at low power, typically 0.02 megawatt with an inherent safe design, is much less than a risk of an operating a 600 megawatt nuclear power plant. Compliance verification activities are planned, documented and implemented with this approach in mind. Compliance verification activities include on-site inspection, document reviews and evaluation of licensee programs and safety performance reports. CNSC staff rate the performance of the licensees against all 14 safety and control areas and staff also verify the licensees compliance in other areas of regulatory interest such as financial guarantees and public information programs. All regulatory requirements are defined in the regulatory framework and licensing basis for each license. For the record, we need to point out two errata in CMD M M, excuse me, I'll repeat that, CMD 18 M32. The first one is on page 14, last line on the second paragraph. The license identified as NPROL 18.012023 was issued for the period ending June 30th, 2023, instead of the reported June 23rd, 2013. The second error is on page 55 on financial guarantees for the Class 1B accelerators. Section 3.9 made reference to contributions to an NRRR fund, Nuclear Reactor Restricted Reserve Fund, which is not the case for Class 1B facilities. Licensees contribute to the, value, to the full value of the decommissioning cost through a letter of credit as a financial instrument for the financial guarantee. We apologize for any confusion this, this may have caused. So with that, I will pass the presentation on to Dr. Ducrot, who will go through part one on research reactors. Thank you, Ms. Tadros. President Fauci, members of the Commission, my name is Carolyn Ducro, and I'm the Director of the Nuclear Processing Facilities Division. The Division is responsible for the licensing and compliance of research reactors in Canada. The next few slides provide an overview of the five research reactors in Canada. These include the McMaster Nuclear Reactor, located in Hamilton, Ontario, and the four Slowpoke II reactors, located at the Royal Military College of Canada in Kingston, Ontario, University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta, Saskatchewan Research Council in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and at École Polytechnique de Montréal in Montreal, Quebec. These research reactors operate at low power. The McMaster nuclear reactor 
or MNR, is licensed for 5 megawatts, but typically operates at 3 megawatts. MNR has the added safety of an airtight containment building. The slowpokes are designed to operate at 0.02 megawatts or 20 kilowatts. All five reactors operate at near ambient temperature and pressure. They are moderated and cooled with light water. The slowpokes are self-limiting in power, meaning that the reactor will not exceed their design power even if they were left unattended. The research reactors have a low environmental footprint. That is, there are no radiological liquid releases to the environment, and the airborne releases are small, as we will see in the environmental protection section of this presentation. The public dose associated with these reactors is in the order of about one microsievert, which is less than 0.1% of the regulatory limit of one millisievert for the member of the public. To put this in context, the average exposure to background radiation in Canada is approximately 1.8 millisieverts. I will now provide some details on each research reactor, starting with the McMaster nuclear reactor. MNR is located on the campus of McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. It has been in operation since 1959. It currently operates under license issued by the CNSC in 2014 for a period of 10 years. It is a pool type reactor fueled with low enriched uranium. The fuel core sits near the bottom of a pool approximately 10 meters below the surface. MNR is an important producer of medical isotopes worldwide, particularly iodine-125 used in cancer treatment. MNR is also used for neutron radiography, in particular for aircraft turbine blades. The reactor is used for a broad range of research activities, including the development of radio pharmaceuticals. In this picture, we see an example of two aircraft engine turbine blades. In the upper left, we see evidence of material from the molding process left in the cooling channels of the blade. The material becomes visible under neutron radiography with a special tracer element. This work is done on a daily basis at the McMaster nuclear reactor. The Royal Military College of Canada, or RMCC, operates a Slowpoke II reactor on the RMCC campus in Kingston, Ontario. The license was issued by the CNSC in 2013 for a period of 10 years. The reactor was commissioned in 1985. It is used for neutron activation analysis, neutron radiography, research, and education. In this picture, we can see the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario. The Slowpoke reactor is located in the Sawyer Science and Engineering Building, identified by the red circle. RMCC announced that they are undertaking the project to refuel the reactor after 32 years of operation at the same fuel core. The Canadian Nuclear Laboratories will provide certified staff to perform this refueling operation. There will be an increased oversight on behalf of CNSC staff for the duration of this project. RMCC will apply for an export permit and a license to transport the used core in a license transport package to a waste management facility in the US. The project is scheduled to start in 2019 for completion in 2021. <clears throat> in this picture, we see an actual size model of a slow poke core. The core is about 30 centimeters in diameter. The fuel core is contained inside a vessel submerged in a pool of water, which shields radiation and dissipates the heat. The beryllium plates on top of the core, known as shims, are used as neutron reflectors and serve to adjust the, the reactivity of the core. <clears throat> the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta, 
operated a slow poke two reactor between 1977 and 2017. The reactor was used for neutron activation analysis, isotope production, education, and research programs. The core was fueled with high enriched uranium, or HEU. In December 2016, the University of Alberta made a decision to cease the operation of the reactor. University of Alberta applied for a license amendment to authorize the decommissioning of the facility. CNSE staff reviewed the detailed decommissioning plan and a license amendment was granted in a decision of the commission on September 22nd, 2017. In 2017, the reactor was defueled and the HEU core was repatriated to the United States in, in, in accordance with the April 2010 agreement between Canada and the United States to return HEU inventories to their countries of origin, country of origin. All components of the reactor were removed and checked for contamination. The pool was drained and the facility was surveyed for contamination. Radiological conditions were consistent with normal background levels. CNSC conducted an, an inspection of the University of Alberta facility in October 2017 and verified completion of the decommissioning activities, including the radiological surveys. University of Alberta submitted an end state report and requested a license to abandon the facility. Upon review of the end state report, CNSC staff recommended to the commission that the operating license be revoked and that a license to abandon be issued. On May 25, 2018, the commission revoked the operating license and issued a license to abandon. The facility can be repurposed for any non-nuclear activities without any restrictions. Saskatchewan Research Council, or SRC, has been in, in operation since 1981. It operates a Slowpoke 2 facility under a license issued by the CNSC in 2013 for a period of 10 years. The facility is located within SRC's Environmental Analytical Laboratories in Saskatoon. The SRC Slowpoke 2 reactor is fueled with high enriched uranium and is the last facility still using HEU in Canada. The reactor has been used for research and neutron activation analysis, which is used to detect trace elements in material samples in mining and oil industries. The reactor has also been used for education in conjunction with the University of Saskatchewan. In December 2017, SRC announced their intention to cease the operation of the reactor and decommission the facility. SRC plans to repatriate the HEU core to the United States under the same agreement between Canada and the US as University of Alberta did to repatriate their reactor core. Decommissioning of the SRC facility will require increased oversight and licensing effort from CNSE staff. The operating license will require an amendment to authorize decommissioning. Other licensing and compliance activities will include the issuance of a transport license and export permit, review of the end state report, and issuance of a license to abandon. CNSC staff expect that the entire project can be completed by the end of 2020. École Polytechnique de Montréal, EPM, exploite un réacteur Slowpoke 2 en vertu d'un permis émis en 2016 par la Commission canadienne de sûreté nucléaire, CCSN, pour une durée de sept ans. Cette installation est située sur le campus de l'Université de Montréal, à Montréal, Québec. Le réacteur, qui est en exploitation depuis 1976, est utilisé pour la recherche, l'enseignement et l'analyse neutronique. 
Le cœur du réacteur est composé d'uranium faiblement enrichi. L'école polytechnique exploite aussi un assemblage sous-critique situé dans une salle adjacente au réacteur Slowpoke 2. Cet assemblage est composé de tiges d'uranium naturel et de sources de neutrons qui sont insérées manuellement dans un ensemble de blocs de graphite. Cette installation est utilisée pour fins d'enseignement et de recherche. L'installation sous critique faisait l'objet d'un permis distinct. Cependant, le permis a été consolidé avec celui du réacteur Slowpoke 2, ceci dans le but d'améliorer l'efficacité du processus de conformité réglementaire. La demande a été approuvée par la Commission le 30 juin 2016 et le permis a été émis regroupant ainsi l'installation Slowpoke 2 et l'assemblage sous-critique sous un même permis. L'assemblage sous-critique n'est que rarement utilisé, sa dernière exploitation remontant à 2012. I will now discuss the regulatory performance of the research reactor facilities with regard to the 14 safety and control areas and other areas of public interest. The CNSC assesses how licensees meet regulatory requirements in 14 safety control areas. This SCA framework is described in Appendix A of the CMD, and the rating methodology is described in Appendix B, as well as in the annex of this presentation. This table provides the performance ratings for the five research reactors for all SCAs during calendar years 2016 and 2017. The ratings are all satisfactory, with the exception of security, which was assessed as fully satisfactory at the McMaster nuclear reactor. McMaster University maintains a high standard of security that goes beyond the requirements for a research reactor operating on low enriched uranium. Events with potential radiological, environmental, or any safety and security implications are carefully monitored at all nuclear facilities in Canada. Events can indicate potential weaknesses in licensees programs, and therefore it is important that these events be analyzed for root causes so that appropriate corrective actions can be implemented. There were no events reported at any of the Slowpoke facilities during 2016 and 2017. There were no abnormal radiation exposures or releases to the environment, and the reactors operated within their operating limits and conditions for which they are licensed. McMaster University reported two events for this period. In July 2016, there was a fire at a McMaster University service building in the vicinity of the reactor building. The reactor was not affected by the fire. The reactor was shut down as a precautionary measure and restarted the following week. Although there was no impact on MNR, the event was reported to the CNSC for its regulatory and public interest. The second event took place in July 2017, when MNR was started up with a Fission Products Monitor, FPM, offline for approximately 10 minutes. There were no consequences associated with this event. The role of the FPM is to detect any fission products in the cooling water, which would indicate a fuel defect, and the FPM would automatically shut down the reactor. It is one of the reactor safety systems. Starting up the reactor with the FPM offline was a contravention of the MNR operating limits and conditions, which state that the FPM must be available and functional when MNR is operating, and therefore the event was reportable under MNR's license. A root cause analysis was performed, which identified contributing factors 
with the use of checklists, communications, training, and assignment of responsibilities. Corrective actions were implemented, which included revision to checklists, verification steps, revision to staff training, and assignment of responsibilities. In an inspection conducted in November 2017, CNSE staff verified that McMaster University had implemented these corrective actions satisfactorily. CNSE staff prepare 10-year baseline inspection plans, as well as facility-specific verification plans using a risk-informed approach. The risk-informed approach is described in CNSE's document, Policy on the Use of a Risk-Informed Approach for Regulatory Oversight of Nuclear Activities and Facilities. This takes into consideration the overall risk of the facility, the operational performance, and the compliance history of the licensee, as well as any changes in the regulatory framework. CNSE staff conduct several other regulatory activities on a day-to-day -day basis, including reviews of annual reports and process documents, discussions around licensing matters, and periodic meetings. This table provides an overview of CNSE's compliance and licensing efforts for the research reactors, including the number of inspections in 2016 and 2017. These efforts, in, term of in terms of person days, can vary from year to year depending on a number of factors, including specific projects undertaken by the licensees, licensee performance, safety significant events, and changes in the regulatory framework. CNSE staff increased its licensing efforts for the University of Alberta in 2017 because of the license amendment and decommissioning activities. SRC and RMCC received fewer compliance and licensing efforts in 2017 due to consistent performance, a stable licensing basis, and efficiencies gained by combining inspections. I will now discuss radiation protection at the research reactors. Different aspects are assessed when CNSC staff verify compliance of each licensee's radiation protection programs in accordance with the SCA framework. These aspects are application of the as low as reasonably achievable, or ALARA principle, worker dose control, radiation protection program performance, radiological hazard control, estimated dose to the public. All the research reactor facilities were rated satisfactory for their radiation protection programs in 2016 and 2017. An important aspect of the radiation protection program is the worker dose control. This table shows the dose statistics for workers at the research reactors. The highest average and maximum doses recorded in 2016 and 2017 are shown for each facility. Some facilities do not need to designate their workers as nuclear energy workers, or NUs, given the very low exposure rates that are encountered in these facilities. This is the case for APM and SRC. RMCC has a combination of NUs and non-NUs. In either of the cases, the doses were well below the regulatory dose limit of 1 millisievert for non-NUs and 50 millisieverts for NUs. McMaster nuclear reactor workers conduct a broad range of activities and radiological work, including isotope production, fuel handling, neutron radiography, and maintenance. However, the average and the maximum effective dose to workers over the past five years demonstrate that they remain consistently well below the regulatory dose limit of 50 millisieverts per year and below the average effective dose limit of 100 millisieverts over five years. MNR workers perform a broad range of radiological work, including iodine-125 production, and therefore, extremity exposure is carefully monitored. 
This figure shows the average and maximum equivalent extremity doses at MNR from 2013 to 2017. The doses were well below the regulatory limit of 500 millisieverts per year. This graph shows the five-year trend for the average effective dose and maximum effective dose to workers at slowpoke reactors. For each year, the highest number was plotted for any of the four slowpoke reactors. These doses have shown to be consistently well below the annual regulatory dose limit of 50 millisieverts, as well as below the average dose limit of 100 millisieverts over five years. I will now discuss the Environmental Protection SCA, comprising two specific areas, which are effluent and emissions control and assessment and monitoring. The Slowpoke 2 facilities release small amounts of radi radioactive noble gases, mainly xenon-133 and xenon-135, resulting from the weekly purges of reactor headspace and argon-41 due to irradiation activities. The releases take place through filters and a dedicated facility stack after sampling and analysis of the headspace cover gas. Once released to the stack, these quantities are below the threshold of detection. MNR's environmental monitoring program includes three monitoring stations located around the facility. Samples are collected weekly. MNR also monitors the exhaust ventilation before the air is released outside. There are no radioactive liquid releases at any of the research reactors. All the research reactor facilities were rated as satisfactory for the Environmental Protection SCA. MNR's Effluent and Emission Monitoring Program consists of monitoring exhaust ventilation for iodine-125 and argon-41, which are the only nuclear substances released to the environment in any measurable quantities. Argon-41 is produced mostly by the irradiation of air present in the sample irradiation system, where samples are moved in and out of the neutron flux of the core by pneumatic action. Derived release limits, or DRLs, are established based on the regulatory public dose limit of one millisievert per year. McMaster also maintains action levels corresponding to a little more than 1% of the DRL. Exceedance of an action level triggers a notification to the CNSC and an investigation which may result in corrective actions to avoid recurrence. There were no exceedances of any environmental action level or regulatory limit at MNR in 2016 or 2017 or over the past five years. This graph shows the five-year trend for iodine-125 releases at MNR. Derived release limits are also established based on a dose of one millisievert as well as action levels. Releases have been consistently below 0.01% of the DRL. The Conventional Health and Safety SEA covers the implementation of a program to manage workplace safety hazards and to protect personnel and equipment. CNSC staff's assessment of this program comprises the following specific areas, performance, practices, and awareness. A key performance indicator for the Conventional Health and Safety SCA is the number of lost time injuries per year. There were no lost time injuries at any of the small nuclear reactor research reactor facilities in 2016 and 2017. CNSC staff determined that the research reactor facilities implement conventional health and safety programs satisfactorily, and that their programs are effective in protecting the health and safety of persons working in these facilities. I will now provide an update on other matters of regulatory interest, 
pertaining to the research reactors. These topics include public information and disclosure, financial guarantees, and regulatory developments over the review period. The research reactor licensees are required to implement public information and disclosure programs as per RDGD 99.3, Public Information and Disclosure, which has now been superseded by RegDoc 3.2.1 of the same title. These programs are supported by disclosure protocols, which outline the type of information to be shared with the public, such as incidents, major changes in operations, periodic environmental performance reports, and information of public interest. The research reactor licensees actively provided information on the operations of their facilities on their websites. And some also undertook activities such as open houses, outreach events, facility tours, and community events. CNSC staff concluded that public information and disclosure programs were being implemented satisfactorily at all research reactor facilities. The Nuclear Safety and Control Act requires licensees to provide a guarantee that sufficient financial resources are available to fund decommissioning activities, which include dismantling, decontamination, and closure of the facility, any post-decommissioning monitoring or institutional control measures that may be required, subsequent long-term management or disposal of all wastes, including used fuel. The research reactors and the Class 1B accelerators do not have a predetermined design life. The CNSC requires licensees to maintain preliminary decommissioning plans with cost estimates and to revise these every five years. CNSC staff review these plans against regulatory requirements and ensure that the costs estimates are credible. These cost estimates form the basis of the financial guarantee, which assures sufficient funding is available at any time during the lifetime of the facility. This means that if the facility were to decommission today, the funds would be available. Financial guarantees are presented to the Commission for acceptance and maintained as part of a license condition for each research reactor licensee. This table lists the five research reactor facilities along with the current value of their respective Nuclear Reactor Restricted Reserve Fund, or NRRR, which constitutes part or all of their financial guarantee. Licensees may contribute annual payments to the NRRR until the financial guarantee is funded to the full value of the decommissioning cost, and they may include other financial instruments as part of their financial guarantee agreement, such as a letter of credit. University of Alberta's financial guarantee is not listed given that they have already completed the decommissioning. The cost of decommissioning of RMCC is assured through a formal written commitment from National Defense. The financial guarantee for École Polytechnique is currently undergoing review and revision. The Nuclear Safety and Control Act requires licensees to provide a guarantee that sufficient financial resources are available to fund decommissioning activities. Yeah, sorry about that. The CNSC continues to modernize the regulatory framework with a series of regulatory documents, or reg docs. This table lists the reg docs that were produced since 2016 and that apply to the research reactors. The license condition handbooks for each licensee are updated periodically to reflect these reg docs. When a new reg doc is published, the licensees are requested to provide implementation plans if the requirements of the reg docs are not already satisfied by the licensee's current programs. It should be noted 
that the regulations must be met at all times. This table lists the updates to the industry standards that apply to the research reactors. These standards also become part of the license condition handbooks once these are updated. CNSC staff verify that the licensees programs continue to meet these standards as part of compliance verification activities. This brings me to the conclusion for part one of the presentation. During 2016-2017, CNSC staff continue to provide regulatory oversight of the research reactor facilities in Canada through inspections, review of licensee documents, and an effective implementation of CNSC's regulatory framework. There are no radiological dose limit exceedances to the public or the workers, environmental releases did not exceed limits, and there are no lost time injuries. All research reactor facilities met all regulatory requirements in the 14 SEAs in 2016 and 2017. Based on this assessment, CNSC staff conclude that research reactor licensees have made adequate provisions for the protection of the environment and the health and safety of persons, and that there were no adverse effects on the health on the environment as a result of the operation of the research reactors. I will now pass the presentation to Mr. Mark Berders, who will cover part two on class 1B accelerators. Thank you, Dr. Ducro. President Velshi, members of the commission, my name is Mark Broders, and I am the director of accelerators and class two facilities division responsible for regulatory oversight of the class 1B accelerators. I will be presenting the next part of this presentation on the performance of the class 1B particle accelerator facilities. The class 1B accelerator facilities are presented with research reactors because they pose similar risk, have a low environmental footprint, and they maintain similar compliance programs. Currently, there are two Class 1B particle accelerator facilities in Canada. These are Triumph and Canadian Light Source, located in Vancouver and Saskatoon, respectively. Triumph's accelerators, uh, Incorporated is located on the University of British Columbia campus in Vancouver and was commissioned in 1974. I would like to correct a typo on the slide. It incorrectly states uh, 1959 as the commission date. I should read 1974. I apologize for that. Triumph is Canada's national laboratory for nuclear and particle physics research and related sciences. Triumph operates one 520 mega electron volt cyclo uh, cyclotron accelerator facility, four smaller cyclotron facilities, three linear accelerator facilities under an operating license issued by the Commission in 2012 for a 10 year period. Triumph is also a major producer of radioisotopes used for medical diagnostic procedures. It is owned and operated as a joint venture by a consortium of 18 Canadian universities. There are approximately 560 persons working at Triumph. Canadian Light Source Incorporated operates a synch synchrotron facility on the University of Sa Saskatchewan campus in Saskatoon under license issued by the Commission in 2012, also for a 10 year period. The facility consists of three major accelerator systems, a 300 MeV linear accelerator, a booster ring that accelerates electrons up to 2.9 giga electron volts, and a storage ring that keeps electrons circulating at this energy for several hours. The facility has been in operation since 2005, and it produces synchrotron radiation that is used as a light source for experiments in diverse scientific fields of biology, materials research, atomic and molecular science, earth sciences, pharmaceuticals, biomedical research, and electronics. I will now discuss the performance of the Class 1B accelerators in regard to the 14 safety and control areas and other areas of public interest, focusing here again on the three SCAs of radiation protection, environmental protection, and conventional health and safety. The performance ratings for each of the 14 safety and control areas were determined by CNC staff based on the results and observations from inspections and desktop reviews. The CNC, CNC evaluates how well licensees meet regulatory requirements 
and CNC expectations for the performance of programs in the 14 SCAs. This table provides the performance ratings for the Class 1B accelerators during the 2016-2017 period. For this period, all individual SCAs were either satisfactory or fully satisfactory for the Class 1B particle accelerator facilities, with the exception of the Management System SCA at CLSI and Waste Management at Triumph, which are both rated below expectations. In 2016, following an inspection focused on management systems in which CLSI received a below expectation rating, CLSI initiated a review of programs to meet N286-12 standard and continued with the implementation of the changes in 2017. The management system SCA was rated as satisfactory in 2017 as a result of this work. The rating for waste management SCA at Triumph was downgraded to below expectations following an inspection in 2016 which found deficiencies related to inventory and labeling of radioactive waste, as well as the absence of secondary containment of some hazardous waste. CNC staff performed a follow-up inspection in October 2017 to verify Triumph's corrective actions. Staff were satisfied with the corrective actions and brought back the rating to satisfactory. In 2016, CNC staff also conducted an inspection focused on radiation protection SCA and found minor deficiencies which brought the, uh, down the rating from fully satisfactory to satisfactory. Overall, these ratings indicate adequate management of safety and control measures at both facilities. There were two events reported by Triumph for the reporting period. On June 10, 2017, the 350 microamp current license limit for radiating cadmium targets was exceeded for the TR32 isotope production cyclotron when it was run at 375 microamp for a period of about one half hour. There were no consequences as a result of this event. However, it was a contravention to Triumph's license operating limits for this type of target. A second event occurred on August 25th and September 1, 2017, when there were two unintentional releases of carbon-11 from the Life Sciences Radiochemistry Annex, both in the range of 35 to 40 gigabacrols. Both releases amounted to 0.1% of the full site releases for the year, and in a worst case would contribute to 0.3 microsieverts to an individual of the most highly exposed group. CNC staff verified that corrective actions developed to prevent recurrence of both events have been implemented. CLSI reported two events in 2016 and one event in 2017. On July 14, 2016, a threat was made by an anonymous caller identifying himself as a member of ISIS. Police and CLSI staff responded, secured, and searched the building. The incident was ultimately determined to be a hoax. On October 12, 2016, CLSI discovered that an electrical disconnect switch was not located, sorry, locked in the off position prior to working on a 600 volt power supply. Upon discovery, the area was promptly secured and the lockout tagout corrected. CLSI conducted an investigation which resulted in several recommendations to reduce the risk of recurrence. CNC staff followed up with an inspection in January 2017. The response and implementation of recommendations by CLSI was uh, subsequently considered acceptable. There are no safety consequences as a result of these incidents. On February 24, 2017, CLSI reported a wiring area in the LINAC Access Control Interlock System, or ACIS system, discovered during annual validation and verification testing. Subsequent to the discovery of the error, CLSI performed a design review for the ACIS system, corrected all discovered errors, and repeated the validation and verification testing. There was no impact on safety due to the design redundancy in the ACIS system. CNC staff verified that corrective action to prevent recurrence have been implemented. The Class 1B accelerators are overall low-risk facilities, with the primary hazard associated with Class 1B facilities being prompt radiation. That is, radiation produced coincident with the beam status. When the power is turned off, the most significant risk is eliminated. The environmental releases are very small. In the case of CLSI, there are no releases. While all SCAs are assessed over the duration of the license, the regulatory compliance efforts typically focus on radiation protection, environmental protection, and conventional health and safety.
The CSC continuously monitors these facilities to provide assurance to Canadians of the continuing compliance and safety performance. This table presents the licensing and compliance effort from CNSC staff for Class 1B particle accelerator facilities in 2016 and 2017. CNSC staff spent a total of 39 person days on licensing activities related to Class 1B accelerators. A total of 450 person days were dedicated to compliance activities, which included inspections of these facilities, license activities and processes, <coughs> as well as desktop reviews of licensee reports. CNC staff performed a total of eight compliance inspections at the Class 1B particle accelerator facilities in 2016 and 2017. All the findings resulting from these inspections were provided to the licensee in detailed inspection reports. Staff con uh, conducted consistent and risk-informed regulatory oversight uh, at the Class 1B accelerator facilities. The Radiation Protection SCA covers the implementation of a radiation protection program in accordance with the radiation protection regulations. The program must ensure that contamination levels and radiation doses received by individuals are monitored, controlled, and maintained ALARA. During 2016-17 period, CNSC staff determined that all Class 1B accelerator facilities implemented effective measures to keep radiation exposures and doses to persons ALARA. This has consistently resulted in doses to persons being well below CNSC regulatory dose limits. The ratings for the Radiation Protection SCA for all Class 1B accelerator facilities were satisfactory or better and remain unchanged from the previous five years. The graph on this slide shows the average and maximum effective radiation doses to nuclear energy workers from 2013 through 2017 for Triumph. The red line represents the regulatory annual effective dose limit of 50 millisieverts for a nuclear energy worker. As shown, the average and maximum dose received by a nuclear energy worker at Triumph were continuously well below the regulatory limit. Effective doses were monitored for non-nuclear energy workers. The maximum dose to non-news in 2016-17 was 0.15 millisieverts. There was no occurrence of actual level exceedance at Triumph. This data demonstrate that doses to work at Triumph are safe and that Triumph's radiation protection program is effective. The graph on this slide shows the average and maximum effective radiation doses to nuclear energy workers from 2013 to 2017 for CLSI. The red line represents a regulatory annual effective dose limit of 50 millisieverts for a nuclear energy worker. As shown, the average and maximum dose received by a worker at CLSI were continuously well below the regulatory limit. The maximum effective dose received by a nuclear energy worker in 2016-17 was 0.12 millisieverts. Effective doses were monitored for non-news. The maximum dose to a non-new in 2016-17 was 0.11 millisieverts. There was no action level exceedances at CLSI. Again, this data demonstrates that doses to worker at CLSI are safe and CLSI's radiation protection program is effective. This table shows the maximum effective doses to a member of the public. The main component for the variation of these values is the 520 MeV cyclotron annual delivered beam charge. During the last five years, the public dose to a member of the public was well below the CNSC regulatory dose limit for a member of the public of one millisiever a year. There are no airborne or liquid effluent releases of radioactive material or hazardous substances from CLSI. And CLSI monitors environmental radiation levels outside of the main building, which are found to be at ambient background radiation levels. Therefore, the estimated dose to the public is at natural radiation background levels. CNC staff conclude that the Class 1B accelerator facilities effectively implement and maintain their RP programs to ensure the health and safety of persons present in their facilities. The Environmental Protection SCA covers programs that identify, control, and monitor all releases of radioactive and hazardous substances and the effects on the environment from facilities or as a result of license activities. Licensees are required to develop and implement policies, programs, and procedures to comply with applicable federal and provincial regulatory requirements to control the release of nuclear and hazardous materials into the environment. Licensees are also expected to have suitably trained and qualified staff to effectively develop, implement, and maintain their environmental protection programs. The rating for the Environmental Protection SCA was satisfactory for Triumph and fully, satis fully satisfactory for CLSI. This is unchanged. Uh, from the previous five years. 
For 2016-17, CNC staff continued to rate the Environmental Protection SCA at Triumph as satisfactory. CNC staff performed an Environmental Protection Inspection at Triumph in 2017 and confirmed that Triumph has an effective Environmental Protection Program. Triumph monitors airborne radiological releases of beta plus emitters, argon-41, noble gases, and volatile and particulate emissions from the Triumph facility. In 2017, Triumph submitted an updated DRL document, derived release limit document, for their airborne and liquid releases, which was reviewed and approved by CNSC staff. This graph shows a trend in airborne releases expressed in percentage of the DRL, which is associated with the one millisievert regulatory annual dose limit to a member of the public. In 2016, the total releases of airborne effluents represented a combined total of 1.04% of the DRL. The action levels are set at 5% of the DRL and none were exceeded at any time over the review period. The annual airborne emissions remain well below the DRLs for the Triumph facility. The results demonstrate that the air emissions are being controlled effectively at this facility. Triumph has no liquid releases to surface waters. There are approved radiological liquid effluent releases to the sanitary sewers which are monitored through various holding tanks and sumps from the facility. Liquid effluent releases, are the most, uh, liquid effluent releases for the most recent five-year period are provided in the slide. 100% of the derived release limit equals a one millisievert annual dose limit to a member of the public. The data for 2017 are reported as the new revised DRL limits to align with CSA N288-1-14. The results demonstrate that the liquid effluent releases are being controlled effectively at the Triumph facility and no action levels were exceeded at any time during the review period. CLSI does not release radiological uh, contaminants to the environment. CLSI operates and accelerated that does not produce any emissions. An inspection was performed in July 2017 and confirmed the fact that there are in fact no releases to the environment. As such, there are no data to present in this section for CLSI. The Class 1B accelerated facilities implement, implemented their environmental pr program satisfactory, satisfactorily and the programs are effective in protecting the health and safety of persons working in their facilities. Licensees are required to report unsafe occurrences to the CNSC as directed by Section 29 of the General Nuclear Safety and Control Regulations. These reports include serious illness or injury incurred or possibly incurred as a result of license activity. No unsafe occurrences were reported by any of the Class 1B accelerator facilities between 2016 and 2017. The ratings for the Conventional Health and Safety SCA were satisfactory for all Class 1B accelerator facilities. Following the inspection in July 2017, the rating for CLSI increased from satisfactory to fully satisfactory. The table on this slide summarizes the number of recordable lost time injuries reported by Class 1B accelerator facilities during 2016-17 period. An LTI is an injury or illness resulting in lost days beyond the date of injury as a direct result of an occupational injury or illness incident. There were four lost time injuries reported in 2017, three at Triumph and one at CLSI. The lost time injuries uh, have remained low in 2016-17. CNSC staff are satisfied that both Class 1B accelerator facilities continue to protect the health and safety of workers and the environment. I will now provide an update on other matters that are of regulatory interest pertaining to the Class 1B accelerator facilities. These topics include public information disclosure, financial guarantees, and regulatory developments over the review period. Class 1B uh, facilities are required to provide open and transparent information to the public in accordance with Reg Doc 3.2.1 Public Information and Disclosure. The Class 1B accelerator facilities actively provided information on the operations of their accelerators and their programs were effective at communicating information about the health, safety, and security of persons and the environment. They have engaged the stakeholders and the community through lectures, outreach events, facility tours, community events, and social media. Class 1B accelerator facilities have successfully implemented public information and disclosure programs. Class 1B accelerator facilities, uh, licensees uh, rather, are required to develop preliminary decommissioning plans, including a financial guarantee to ensure sufficient financial resources are available to, de to fund decommissioning activities. 
The table in this slide lists the Class 1B accelerator facilities along with the current value of their respective financial guarantees. Licensees contribute to the full value of the decommissioning costs through a letter of credit as financial instruments for their financial guarantee. The table in this slide updates the Commission on the status of implementation by the Class 1B accelerator facilities of regulatory documents published from 2016 to, through 2018. CNC staff verify the implementation as part of their ongoing compliance uh, verification activities. This table lists the updates to the industry standards that were made in 2016-17, which apply to these facilities. CNC staff continue to verify the implementation of the most recent updates through the periodic compliance verification activities. This brings me to the conclusion on the regulatory performance of the Class 1B accelerator facilities. All Class 1B accelerator facilities were rated satisfactory or fully satisfactory for all 14 SCAs in 2017. There were no radiological dose limit exceedances to the public or to workers. While most SCAs were rated satisfactory or above in 2016, the management system uh, SCA at CLSI and waste management SCA at Triumph were rated below uh, expectations. Both licensees have implemented or are in the process of implementing corrective actions approved by CNSC staff. During 2016-17, CNSC staff continued to provide regulatory oversight of the Class 1B accelerator facilities in Canada through inspections, review of licensee documents, and an effective implementation of CNSC's regulatory framework. CNC staff conclude that the Class 1B accelerator licensees continue to operate these facilities while protecting the health and safety of the public and the workers, the environment and security, and in compliance with Canada's international obligations on the peaceful use of nuclear energy. I will now pass the presentation to Ms. Heidi Tadros to speak to, um, to the overall conclusions on research reactors and Class 1B accelerators. Thank you. For the record, this is Heidi Tadros. Performance of research reactors in Class 1B accelerators was rated satisfactory to fully satisfactory in all 14 SCAs in 2017. CNSC staff spent a total of 961 person days on regulatory compliance activities, including 17 inspections for the research reactors in Class 1B accelerators combined. Through these compliance verification activities, CNSC staff have found that the radiation protection programs at these facilities were adequate in controlling radiation exposures and keeping doses as low as reasonably achievable, that there were no radiological dose limits that were exceeded for the public or the workers, that the environmental protection programs were effective, that release, radiological releases to the environment were kept at a small fraction of the regulatory limits, and that conventional health and safety programs at all facilities continue to protect workers. As outlined in the previous slide, CNSC staff continue to provide regulatory compliance oversight to all licensed facilities to ensure that the facilities continue to make adequate provision to protect the health, safety and security of workers, Canadians and the environment. CNSC staff will also continue to ensure Canada's international obligations on the peaceful use of nuclear energy are implemented and adhered to. This concludes the presentation on the regulatory oversight report for the research reactors in Class 1B accelerators for 2016-17. We would like to note, though, in annex of this presentation, we have provided several slides summarizing the rating methodology used in this ROR, with some examples to demonstrate the implementation of the methodology. CNSC staff can speak to these if needed and are also available to answer any questions the Commission may have. Thank you. Thank you.